And uh, I am the chairperson of this uh, session. My name is Irina Bushkina, and we have our uh, four, one, two, three, four presenters here, and we have our seventy here, and we will do as exactly as we did in the previous session. So every presenter is six, eight minutes, and immediately we will start. And I invite Ivan Kuriva, uh, who is our first presenter from the European University at St. Petersburg. Thank you, Irina. Uh, I, should start, uh, I should start by confessing that I engaged in this title uh, in the early summer of uh, 2018, just on the eve of the health assignment between uh, President Trump and President Putin, and that was a uh, kind of uh, speculation about the possibility of uh, rapprochement, which uh, failed, of course, as we all know. So I decided, by the time I needed to write this uh, policy memo, I decided to go a little bit uh, more like theoretical, but still, uh, I, I think that's uh, an important uh, step to think about the conditions under which Russia and the United States could and probably should uh, come to the better terms that it is now. Of course, in the midst of uh, sanctions, uh, Russia investigation here, uh, propaganda, anti-American propaganda in Russia, everything looks very uh, far distant from from this situation, but uh, still, uh, if you look, okay, I should confess again that I'm a historian, and uh, so it's easier for me to look in the previous uh, examples of Russian-American detente or resets or uh, whatever uh, word was used uh, in the periods of uh, uh, relative uh, improvement of Russian-American relations, and I asked myself in what was what were the um, conditions under which those resets and tons uh, were possible. And the first uh, and easiest uh, you know, hypothesis would be that it was a time when Russia and the United States uh, in its foreign policy, respective foreign policy, were uh, less confrontational and it's when uh, Russia was not aggressive, we would say, or the United States did not interfere into Soviet time uh, sphere of influences. But if you look back in the periods, it's, uh, it doesn't work. This explanation didn't work because, doesn't work because well, mm, we had a uh, detente in 1970, at the time when the United States fought in the Vietnam War, and just two years, less than two years uh, after the Soviet Union interfered into Czechoslovakia events at the Prague Spring, and did not add, uh, this interference did not influence at the possibility of Russian and American rapprochement. If you look uh, at uh, previous uh, relative uh, easiness in Russian American relations under Nikita Khrushchev and President Eisenhower, here it was also just a couple of years after the Budapest uh, Hungarian rebellion, which was smashed by the Soviet power, and also it, 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 uh, that event did uh, also uh, not. Uh, influence at the possibility of, of Russian American uh, Russian. So that is not not the case. I mean, the uh, conditions under which Russia and the United States, Soviet Union, the previous uh, century, and the United States uh, found a way uh, to you know, to come together to uh, relative friendship, I would say, uh, could not be found in the international. And uh, so I looked at the domestic conditions. And we see that there is a, something uh, common, in common, uh, in, the in, in this repeating cycles of uh, Russian-American rapprochements, uh, both in the domestic conditions of Russia and in the domestic conditions of the United States. And if you look in, the, in Russia, and take just the last uh, okay, century, I mean, since the Soviet Union time, and we see that uh, every time when uh, Russian government, Russian uh, what was it, uh, communist government or post-communist, uh, every time that uh, Russian government decided or was, um, you know, put in its agenda uh, the task of uh, economic uh, breakthrough to acceleration of economic development or industrialization, Whatever economic reforms which needed to boost uh, Russian and Soviet economy, at that point uh, Russia started to seek uh, friendship of the United States. 
It was so, okay, you remember the uh, Russian, the first Soviet-American uh, diplomatic relations were established in 1933 at the peak of Russian industrialization, and it was sick uh, for several years by the time. Uh, Khrushchev, uh, rapprochement with the United States was this when Khrushchev uh, pursued the uh, economic reforms. Uh, early Brezhnev years, which is the time, was also, uh, also featured so-called Kassidian reforms in, in, in the Soviet Union. And I think when Gorbachev uh, come to come uh, to Rapprochement with uh, Ronald Reagan at the time when he announced Uskarenia, acceleration, or boost of the Soviet economy as a goal. So that was a repeating uh, model, repeating pattern of, 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 of the Soviet and Russian side. Or to, to take the more, most recent uh, example when uh, president Dmitry Medvedev, uh, when he became president and he started to use word modernization and he immediately went to Silicon Valley and brought iPhones back. So that was a repeating pattern for the Soviet side. But let's move to American side. And you will see that this, this, there is also a uh, similar domestic situation in every year, every period when uh, the United States and the Russia and Soviet Union come together, came together. And that is a different story. Uh, on the American side, we see that uh, the United States, each time uh, it came to better term with the Soviet Union, was at the end or immediately after the big internal domestic crisis. In 1933, okay, Great Depression was, uh, uh, okay, the, okay, after the great, immediately after the Great Depression, the, uh, the United States recognized the Soviet Union. Uh, Late 50s with uh, Eisenhower. That was the end of the very uh, harsh 50s with McCarthyism. McCarthyism was also a symptom of the deeper uh, deeper problems of American society. Mm, okay, uh, detente under Nixon and Brezhnev in uh, early 70s was the, several years after, I would say, 1968 with the uh, political martyrs and all of this uh, very tumultuous uh, 60s in the United States. And Ronald Reagan actually explicitly uh, said that he wants better relations with the Soviet Union even before Gorbachev came to power because his agenda was to make America great again. You remember who it was the author of that, of that slogan. Uh, Ronald Reagan actually needed to change internally, to, to influence internal agenda, and the Soviet Union, or later Russia, uh, did play an important role in the whole domestic political uh, battles around identity, uh, American identity. So Reagan also did it. So uh, to jump here, I know my time is almost uh, over. To jump to the uh, current situation, we see that uh, in the last two years there was a kind of miscalculation on the both sides, because uh, okay, uh, Putin uh, after his election last year of 1918 probably uh, planned uh, this new type of modernization, and he is of course he is not the same type of modernization that. Gorbachev did, but uh, still Putin's, uh, these reforms that were discussed in the first panel, I think it was, uh, and that was, uh, they were aimed into domestic uh, development, and that was exactly the condition when Russia was uh, able or ready to, to go to, to friendship with the United States. But okay, so, uh, it's certainly Mr. Putin on the Putin's uh, side. On the Trump side, Trump uh, just repeated uh, as I've already mentioned, repeated the slogan of Ronald Reagan, and he probably thought that he is coming to the White House as the, you know, to finish uh, a big uh, identity crisis in the United States. In fact, he was, a, uh, I would say, embodiment of that crisis he became to. And so this is not, a, not that, that uh, historical period when uh, this is possible to, to, to use uh, relations with Russia as a, as a healing tool. As, it happened with uh, Ronald Reagan. But the idea was there. I think that the idea of uh, Trump was to repeat what Ronald Reagan done and to change the, uh, to, to, to make Russia from the four a friend and, uh, and by this, by doing this, to change, to influence the American domestic uh, identity. And, you know, as a uh, very last uh, line here, uh, will it, when actually Russia and the United States uh, again, get back to, to French, or not to French, but at least to, to normal relations, I would say. And that can be not as 
distant as we are now feeling, because uh, the United States is now in the identity crisis, and this crisis will eventually end some way. Either Trump will win, that is, well, maybe not much possible, but still I can, I can imagine it is theoretically, or Trump will be overtaken by democratic forces. At least, you know, in several years from now, the United States will be in exactly the situation after the crisis, after the, you know, upon the Russia. And that, that will be a time to seek better relations with Russia, as it happened in the previous, previous period. Okay, in, in Russia, the situation may be much more difficult because we don't know when Mr. Putin will vacate Kremlin. But uh, again, on the Russian side, actually, at this point, uh, there is a lot of, uh, I think, uh, readiness for the improvement of the relations, just because the Russian side will came to this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Irina. Thank you, everyone, for uh, sticking with us till the end here. Um, so I'm going to present a, a brief summary of a report that is coming out uh, next month uh, with the French uh, think tank yeah, E3 uh, on uh, Russian uh, security interests in Southeast Asia. And uh, if anyone is interested in the full report and can't wait, until March 1st, uh, feel free to contact me or contact the Polinaris uh, organizers who can put in touch with me and I can get you a copy uh, anytime uh, at this point. So, so this is just kind of a summary. And the other thing I should say is this is uh, I, I, my presentation, but the report and, and this uh, memo are co-authored with my colleague uh, uh, Paul Schwartz, uh, from also from CNA. So uh, that's just by way of background. Um, the uh, uh, Russia's relations with Southeast Asia are part of an overall turn east that started after the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, and the goal was to reduce dependence on the West and to harness uh, the economic growth of the uh, Asia Pacific region to modernize the Russian Far East. Uh, the first, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk about it. There were, initially, there wasn't very much in the way of action. Uh, the first concrete action was the uh, APEC summit in Vladivostok in 2012, uh, which was kind of intended to jumpstart uh, economic cooperation efforts uh, in the Far East. Uh, China has always been the highest uh, priority for this, uh, this kind of uh, pivot to the East, uh, but Russia wanted diversity uh, to avoid uh, excessive dependence on, on Beijing, and Southeast Asia played the key role uh, in this effort. So, uh, Russia sought to build on existing relations uh, with uh, Vietnam, uh, with Indonesia, with Myanmar, uh, and then to expand relations with uh, other countries, including some U.S. allies, such as uh, Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, as well. Uh, there were three components of the pivot as initially conceived. Uh, kind of a civilizational alliance against Western universal values, uh, then a geopolitical effort to provide a, a regional alternative to the US-centered uh, alliance system in, in Southeast Asia, uh, and then a geoeconomic push to integrate Russia into the uh, dynamic uh, Asian economy. Uh, as I already hinted, uh, the, this pivot proved uh, long on rhetoric, but relatively short on uh, concrete actions. There were relatively few act, uh, efforts to move beyond kind of a limited uh, economic cooperation, and in particular, uh, the diversification effort has been uh, has been limited. So Russia, Russian foreign policy has remained deeply Sino-centric. Uh, Southeast Asia remains. Um, you know, after we did a lot of research, we, we came up with the conclusion that Southeast, Southeast Asia remains in kind of the bottom tier of uh, Russian priorities in the region, um, below not only China but also other East Asian states and also India. So. Uh, there is continuing, uh, there are continuing expressions of interest on the part of Russian uh, officials, uh, and they regularly visit the region or invite uh, uh, the leaders from the region to visit Russia, uh, and par partially for economic reasons, partially because they want to balance this, uh, uh, what they increasingly recognize as a junior partner role for Russia vis-a-vis -vis China, 
uh, and then and with, with some other um, relations in the region. Uh, but, and so, so relations as a result are improving somewhat, but it's, it's still not, uh, Russia's still not very significant as a player in Southeast Asia. Um, and so Russia remains uh, kind of beho uh, beholden, uh, the Russia's relations with the region remain beholden largely to its relationship with China, uh, and then secondary to relations with other parts of the world. So, uh, in particular, uh, Russia has consistently failed to capitalize on its membership in ASEAN, the regional organization, uh, to deepen engagement in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, trade has been increasing, but is still very weak. So, uh, in uh, I think it's 2017 is the data I have. Uh, trade had increased five times with the region compared to 2005, but it was still only 0.66% of ASEAN's total tra trade turnover with Russia. Uh, so, so very limited. Uh, it's been a little, there's been a little bit more success in expanding uh, security ties uh, in the region, especially uh, with Vietnam. And there have been some major arms sales to Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, and these are all things that are described in lots of detail in reports if you're interested in bilateral relations on, on specific uh, specific countries. I, I'm, I'm going to pretty much skip that, but it's all there in the, in the report. Uh, but Russia has been really limited by uh, a lack of political, military, and economic resources to effectively fulfill any kind of a soft balancing role for the region against China and the US. And that's really in the security realm what a lot of the countries there would want from Russia. Uh, unlike China, Russia uh, doesn't pose a security threat to anyone in the region. It uh, has no territorial claims. It's tried for many years to avoid taking sides in regional disputes, such as in the South China Sea, although it's recently had to come off that a bit because of the dependence on China. Uh, its regional security views uh, on multipolarity, uh, non-intervention, various other issues all align pretty well uh, with Southeast Asian states. And, they, uh, and so Ru uh, Russia has for many years uh, tried to credibly, uh, portray itself and done a reasonably credible job of um, uh, portraying itself as a neutral kind of status quo power in the region and therefore a potential honest broker uh, for mediating disputes. Uh, and that would make uh, Russia an attractive partner potentially uh, for the states in the region despite a relatively weak economic and security footprint. The uh, 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 Okay, uh, so uh, let me talk a little bit then, I'll skip ahead a bit, to um, the regional implications of, uh, of uh, uh, the study. And so Moscow, first of all, Moscow's ability to maintain and expand uh, its, uh, its relations in the region depends on continued stability. And on, uh, and on hope, really, that the region would avoid increased competition uh, with China, uh, which would force Russia to choose side, to, to choose sides. The problem for Russia is that it would clearly, if, if it had to choose sides, it would choose China, and the states in the region know that, uh, which makes it difficult to, uh, for, for Russia to play the role it would like to play. And, uh, and that would, of course, uh, if, if Russia chose China, then the Southeast Asian states would have to uh, either uh, uh, Go, uh, uh, align more with the United States or, or potentially bandwagon with China if they thought that the uh, United States was really hopeless for whatever reason. So, so Moscow's ability to preserve this balance is, is limited. Uh, the regional states know that Russia can't stop China, so they can't bank on Russia as a strategic alternative. Um, and uncertainty in the region about U.S. foreign policy under Trump has limited Southeast Asia's ability to shift to the U.S. Uh, as an alternative to China. And so more and more they're bandwagoning. Uh, <coughs> uh, and Russia has therefore been placed in a relatively uh, difficult position, uh, moving more and more towards China's uh, position on various territorial disputes. They've held uh, bilateral naval exercises in the South China Sea. And this has then created further concerns in Southeast Asia uh, about Russia's re reliability as a uh, counterweight. Uh, finally, 
Russia has tried to exploit tensions between the United States and regional governments over human rights uh, and economic issues. We saw that most clearly when um, in the closing uh, stages of the Obama presidency when there was uh, some pretty heated rhetoric uh, with uh, Philippines, for example, and uh, uh, President Duterte was talking about buying Russian arms and this sort of thing. Um, but, uh, but that hasn't produced a lot of uh, you know, long-term uh, uh, realignments or anything. It's just been kind of, kind of limited to rhetoric. So just to a uh, final couple words on uh, where this is going. Uh, at the regional level, I, it, uh, I, I believe that the Kremlin will continue to do just enough to maintain a role in the regional organizations to which it belongs, such as ASEAN and APEC. Uh, but uh, in Moscow, the uh, Officials recognize that these organizations are limited and that Russian goals are best served through bilateral ties, and that's where the, the, the majority of the uh, effort will be uh, uh, expended. Um, and at the bilateral level, Moscow is going to uh, continue to try to play to its uh, economic strengths. So oil and gas exploration, uh, nuclear energy, uh, investment in transportation, and most importantly, arms sales. Uh, uh, the uh, and, and those are all areas where engagement will continue, but will be hindered by some of these constraints that I've already discussed vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China and the overall relations uh, priority. So I'll stop there and uh, welcome any discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So my presentation focuses on the Arctic, and what I'd like to do is um, present an uh, examination of how changes in U.S. policy affect Russia and China in this part of the world. And um, so, so I'm looking. And now we can we I open the questions and answer session. And during the session, the presenters afterwards can also answer to the to the to the comment. And I start from here, Sana, please. question about um, Jesse's paper, and this echoes a little bit with what the discussant was just saying, but um, I was reading through your, your policy memo, and I, I wanted to push you a bit to talk about why it's so important to change, to call it a civil war to get the OSCE involved, because, and I this might just be my ignorance, but is there a, I, I wondered if there's a legal reason that it has to be a civil conflict, like it's an intervention they're not allowed to. I didn't think there was, but maybe I was missing it. Um, because it does seem like if the terminology of civil war is irksome to one side, more than irksome, it, it really sounds like South Korea here, but then yeah. it's troublesome to one side, don't call it that, but still get the OSCE involved. Like, use different words. <laughs> you find neutral words, but it seems like civil war definitely is gonna provoke a reaction, but that actually invoking that language makes it harder for the OSCE to get involved, arguably. Um, that was my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. We collect some of the questions. I'm, I'm uh, Bill Hill, currently with the Kennan Institute, but uh, over the last uh, 25 years with uh, State Department, USDOD, and uh, OSCE, uh, I've worked in conflict management in uh, Transnistria, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and uh, in Ukraine. And I would suggest, I think, as in both as an analytical and uh, operational approach, um, certainly for pr pr practitioner, and perhaps uh, as an academic approach, I, I think that a, a strict distinction between civil war and interstate conflict is not really appropriate for this. I would put the Ukraine conflict along with the other conflicts as part of a post-Soviet dissolution in which there are elements of civil war clearly in all of them, because there are elements of the local population and elites who are in conflict, as well as involvement of Moscow in all of them for various interests that Moscow has dating from you know, the Soviet and then sometimes even from the Russian imperial period. And therefore, to, to try to separate, I, I find it's a more useful category to look at them, and there are differences between each of them, depending upon the peoples and territories, uh, but there is this commonality. They, they are hard to define because 
they have elements of both in the sense that Moscow probably, as an Odessa oblast, if the local population is so inclined, the efforts of Moscow to provoke local conflict fail. And you know, 100 people are burned alive and there is not a local protest. But in other places where there is, are the local conditions, uh, the, there is a potential and perhaps at times a real conflict that starts, and sort of a chicken and egg approach and you get Moscow involved. So my, my suggestion is that you, know, where you, you can't simply take the absolute position that the Ukrainians do, that this is simply foreign intervention without any local involvement, uh, that you can't involve uh, or ignore the external hand otherwise. And the OSCE is already involved. There are two OSCE missions on the ground. The OSCE is involved in backing the, uh, uh, the settlement talks um, you know, the problem is that no matter who's involved in the settlement, if the parties don't want to settle, or at least one of them don't, then you aren't going to get very far, believe me, I know from long experience. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just wonder from Bob, how could you mention the Arctic without getting onto the Lomonosov Bridge? And what's the situation there? By the way, on China going up there, every all the Arctic, as I understand, is divided up already into EEZs. China has no claim on an EEZ up there. What about that? and uh, all countries, but we haven't said a word about Latin America. And Venezuela is obviously in a very precarious state. Russia has interests there. There is chaos in other parts of the continent. You talked about an act of foreign policy. It would be very helpful, given the chaos in the United States over migration, how Russia may be working with that in its own particular ways, in terms of fomenting additional chaos in Nicaragua, El Salvador and Guatemala, and what pronouncements it's been making. So I'd, I'd like a little discussion of a continent we have not talked about at all. We already had a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> no, we thought, please be very brief, just like two minutes, because we have other issues. Chaos is not conducive to that. 
For example, Russia would be much happier with a stable Venezuela run by Maduro uh, than an unstable Venezuela where there's a possibility that Maduro will be uh, displaced. Um, so, so I think that what, what Russia has been uh, seeking for many years are kind of beachheads uh, in the region. And there was a period of some years ago when it was actually doing better than it is now. Uh, Venezuela was more stable. Uh, there were a number of countries that had recently brought, uh, elected or uh, other, uh, well, I think generally elected, uh, left-wing uh, leaders who are anti-US and therefore willing to work with Russia. Uh, Ecuador, Bolivia, Nicaragua, uh, I think Cuba was a constant draw on this as well. Uh, so some of those have now either some of those remain, some of those are weakened, and some of those are uh, 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 have been replaced. So, so now the, what, what is uh, what we're seeing is kind of an effort, uh, in some ways parallel to the early stages in Syria, of trying to hold what they already have, which is in Venezuela, um, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, but, uh, but I wouldn't. Uh, I, would, I would think of it as more of uh, trying to maintain influence or, in some cases, expand it. Uh, just very briefly on, on Chris's uh, uh, great points, um, I'm not an expert on the domestic politics of any of these countries in Southeast Asia, so uh, I don't think I can speak to the, their policy capacity. I think it, you're, you're probably right that it's not vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia, it's not huge, but I just don't have the details on that. Um, the, and my, and, uh, my, my sense is that Russia gives very little uh, attention to operating beyond the state. It is very much a state-to-state -state kind of uh, relationship. And uh, in part, uh, or in large part, because of the kinds of things that they are interested in, in, in the kinds of relations they're interested in developing. They're interested in de developing uh, arms sales, nuclear energy, and oil and gas exploration. Those are all largely things where in most countries, uh, certainly in all the countries in, the, in this region, you have to deal with the state. So I think that, that's where the focus is. Uh, and I think that uh, the, uh, the entrance of more Russian business uh, in any part of the world is not helpful for um, a country's ability to grapple with corruption. So that is just as true there as anywhere. So let me answer some of the questions, excellent questions. From Chris, first of all, uh, you know, the, the uh, question is Russia and China are kind of pushing us toward this more hard-nosed uh, focus on military and energy production, and how deep is the commitment in, in Russian science? I think obviously the, the priorities in Russia and, and, and I guess even China to some extent are less influential, but are are definitely on the military side, not the energy side, and, and much less with the commitment to science. But I think that the U.S. administration by not emphasizing that, is sort of taking some of its um, real strategic capacities off the table and not using them to full effect to sort of show a contrast between a power that sort of takes a holistic approach that, you know, obviously under Obama we did pursue military interests, we did pursue energy interests, and also these other, you know, sort of softer kind of interests in the environment and science, like showing the, the contrast between our countries. And Obama in some ways was able to show what could be accomplished having those, those better uh, international institutions. And that sort of is put in stark relief by the Lomonosov stuff. You know, in 2007, Russia famously planted a titanium clay on the seabed under the North Pole. And if any event that Putin ever did in, in his sort of, um, you know, asserting his masculinity, that grabbed the attention of the Western audience, and that really focused people on the Arctic, and that we need to do something. If Putin's up there planting his flag, then we need to be up there <laughs> doing something about it. You know, if, if, if we only build an ice-breaking ship or something like that. So that really got the attention. So that was probably a strategic error on Putin's part because he drew attention to something that he probably wanted to do more quietly. Where does the settlement go? Well, right. So then, obviously, the Russia now claiming this huge bridge yeah, as it's, land. It's, so it's, it's basically a land grab. And, and so the idea would be that, um, you know, they've made their claim to the UN, and so, and, and the US doesn't really have a big role to play in this because we haven't ratified the law of the sea, so it's, it's a very complicated issue. 
But, and so, you know, according to the way it's going now, Russia can say, well, we're playing by the rules of international law, and we'll see what happens uh, when the committee decides. But obviously, if the committee decides that that land was not Russia's, that they do not control that uh, sea space, then obviously Russia might be in a position where it's going to overturn, you know, it's going to reject the international law, as, as plenty of countries do when they don't like the, the rulings of international law, including the United States. And so for China, the, um, the, the, the Arctic is, is basically a place to, to, to trade, to send the ships from China to Europe. It's a lot quicker than going through the Suez Canal. I'm kind of dubious that this is going to be a real trading route because it, even if all the ice melts up there, it's still going to be a cold place with lots of storms. So it's not, you know, it's the insurance companies that are going to decide at the end of the day whether or not that this is really a trading route that the Chinese can use uh, on, a, on a constant basis. But for them, it's all about uh, trade. And so I think there you're going to have, if, if Russia is able to claim this land as its own territory, it's going to block the Chinese from, from uh, doing the kind of free and open trade that they want. So I think that's going to create another uh, area of conflict for those two as well. So leave it as, but in, in, in those cases, the US would be better off if it had uh, spent more time sort of developing international institutions and showing that those institutions were important and then putting in contract that they decided to kick over one of those institutions because they don't like the way it decided this particular issue, then that, that would give the U.S. a little bit of a firmer ground to stand on in, in opposing that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll take the questions in reverse order. Um, uh, first off, thank you for your service. And um, uh, I agree substantially with your larger analytic point that there in the post-Soviet space isn't a good way to actually separate out international from um, domestic processes. Um, most of my serious um, academic work that's involved, extended field work, was in Tajikistan. And so I spent, I, I take very, very seriously everything that you said. I mean, I, I make a self-deprecating joke sometimes that, you know, my, I'm primarily a specialist in the politics of Tajikistan, <coughs> and I'm secondarily a specialist in the politics of Georgia. And the only thing I'm really actually good at doing is comparing Tajikistan to Georgia. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm way off of my um, off of my billet here with Ukraine. But one of the things that the comparison does actually get you that's useful, um, at least it was useful for me, what can I say, is that there is a difference, um, a big difference, between the Tajik settlement and the Georgian settlement. In the Tajik settlement, there was a great um, deal of consensus and complementarity among the interests of the great powers in terms of what they wanted out of the settlement. And in Georgia, there wasn't. You know, essentially, um, the, 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 that's why the Abkhazia model is, um, is so clear as to be exported to the um, to the Ukraine case. The idea that you've got two great powers that actually are trying to bargain with each other um, in you know, using proxy militias is quite dangerous um, when you think about Abkhazia with less secure borders, really big, closer to Russia's nuclear red lines, you know, all of that kind of stuff. The Abkhazia model in um, the Donbass is not something to be celebrated. So I, I um, but, but to, your, to your analytic point, that it's actually hard to draw a clean line between civil war and interstate war in the post-Soviet space for all kinds of reasons. I mean, I'm right with you. Um, I, I draw the analytic point uh, more sharply in this room um, with an audience of people with very long attention spans who know the proper nouns, primarily so that I could uh, talk about the commitment problem and Barbara Walters' work. Um, and you know that that is a really important thing for everyone to just kind of have in their minds um, because I think that it is oftentimes left out of the Ukraine story. That because for most of us intuitively, if we're in the West, are on the Ukrainian side and as, as, a, as a first move, we say, well, the Russians need to go home. And then, you know, then we'll talk about settlement. And that, that's what, what's missing from there is the people who are already home. Um, now, um, does using the term civil war, I, um, does using the term civil war um, dynamite the bridge that I'm trying to build? Yeah, maybe, I don't know. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a professional diplomat, and like the claim is definitely not that this is the optimal way to um, get an Ozier mission in there to oversee the election that needs to take place in the Donbass region. I mean, they had an election a couple of months ago, it's just nobody recognized it. Um, and the, the simplified version of the Minsk II bargaining problem is that everyone agrees on what needs to happen, but um, the Russians say that the election needs to happen first before they pull out the heavy weaponry, and the Ukrainians say the election would be meaningless if it happens under the auspices of Russian guns. I think this would be a really, really good place for the entire OSCE to um, uh, nip the Ukrainian argument in the bud and say, no, it's going to be a really, really great election. Um, and it's, there's going to be, it's going to be contested and everything. Yeah? And, and yeah, uh, 
99.9% of the people voted for the party, yeah, yeah. And elections like that happen sometimes, you know, and when we're here with our OSCE stamp to say that, um, that those four seats in the RADA are going to a um, radically, radically pro-Russia party. And, and then they have seats in the RADA, and um, that, that, is, uh, you know, that, that, that will be a holding your nose exercise for a lot of professional diplomats in the OSCE, but I think it's better than the alternative. Um, and, um, it may be, though, that in order to get there, we need to do what the Ukrainian government does, which is call aggression. Um, it could be that, that the language of civil war is simply too toxic to your point, Chris, um, that, that it, it loses you more allies than it gains. The only thing I'm going to say um, in my defense with the language, um, beyond what I've already said, is that um, if you look, it, it is worth noticing how many parties are getting ready to run in the 26, in the, excuse me, in the 2019 Ukrainian election, explicitly part in, building into their party platform uh, the rejection of Minsk. You know that they that because Minsk II was negotiated at gunpoint, we should we should just make it clear that we're done with the Minsk II agreement. I don't think that in the West this is something to, to be celebrated, and we have, we have a lot of leverage. If you look at IMF packages, if you look at a lot of other things, we could we could potentially begin to define a center coalition, which is is defined by Minsk compliance, and I don't think that that would be a bad um, a bad starting point for the conversation. It, whether or not that includes the term civil war. <coughs> it's not I, I just wanted you guys to understand the argument. Also, I, I'm sorry, I do want to say one more thing. I'm not sure, so I need citations where I'm not going to get promoted in my job. So my instinct is definitely to put, name the book Ukraine Civil War and then have everyone get really mad at me and, <laughs> cite, um, and be the Ukraine Civil War guy, you know, with like an article of the national interest or something. And then I won't have a problem getting an outside offer and my kids can have like health insurance. <laughs> and I really mean that. And, and no, I, I, I really, I want to be, be dead serious here. That's how much of a public diplomat I'm not. Like, I, I do not have the job of speaking on behalf of my government at OSCE. Um, my co-author um, is more concerned about the title. But the, the problem is that people who are looking to read into our argument evidence that we are just shilling for the Kremlin are going to do it anyway. Right? If, if we bury this argument, if, if we call the book I don't something... I that. Yeah. No, I'm done. No, I'm done. No, no respectfully. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. So just very briefly to respond to the question on Latin America, I think I would just, uh, to augment what um, Dimitri mentioned, I think in countries like Venezuela, Nicaragua, and the Latin area to Syria, people in those societies have agency and they've been signaling their wishes in a way, and they've been brutalized by their own governments, sometimes in unspeakable ways in these cases. And I think we then have to look at the sort of um, participation that's either ameliorating the environment there or harming it. And I think you know, while we haven't focused on the domestic level of analysis mostly, that's certainly a part of the discussion, and maybe that would be some fodder for a future Conrad's uh, meeting, but I'd leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for your Uh, as somebody who is also State Department, Defense Department, Congressional Health and Deacon Nation, one of the for Soviet Union, I very much welcome any outside intervention that tries to challenge the terminology with which Washington is obsessed in dealing with Ukrainian issues. I disagree in part with your terminology for reasons which Bill Hill enunciated, but I would not want you to go back to San Diego feeling that you've been chased out of Washington with pitchforks. Uh, I actually think that trying to shake up people's automatic assumptions about the use of terminology in this conflict or any of these other conflicts is a healthy thing, and that's what people in your line of work really ought to be doing. I don't share your optimism. But I will quote you something that a very experienced American diplomat, Chaz Freeman, said, that optimism is for a diplomat, but courage is for a soldier. 
it doesn't necessarily guarantee any outcome. But without it, you can't even function. So stay optimistic, folks. <laughs> Question from Professor Driscoll. Uh, we, we've already talked with the potential benefits of changing the language and legitimizing the terms of the war when applied to Ukraine. Can you talk us through the risks that you see in a change of the language? Um, specifically, in, does it not resolve Russia's responsibility? Does it not endanger the sanctions regime that Europeans are trying to hold up? And if we change the language, do we make sure that it doesn't embolden Russia to continue with that kind of behavior? I think I'm the only person here based in Southeast Asia, so um, I'm the top league. I essentially agree with um, just about everything that you said. Uh, that the relationship is fairly thin and insubstantial, especially in the context and under the shadow of the larger Russian and China relationship. And think of it in terms of the, the demand and supply for the relationship. What is it that Russia can offer Southeast Asia? What is it Southeast Asia wants from Russia? It doesn't amount to a hit of beans. I mean, we've covered the beans, so to speak. It's uh, mostly it's civil nuclear technology and, and, and weapons. And now, actually, sources of food to, to, to replace at least some of those that Russia has self-sanctioned from Europe. Vietnam is a particular problem because it's the country in Southeast Asia with Russia has the best relationship and to which China has the worst. So there's a, there's a sort of tension there. Um, I just also say that I think it's slightly more complicated than saying that most of these countries are simply bandwagon into China. It's a more variegated uh, set of uh, pattern of relationships, particularly what's recently happened in, in after Malaysian election. Yes. But one just final larger point here. So this is, as it were, a normal relationship. It's a, as more generally, much of Russia's relationships with Asia are. They're normal. They're based on the demand and supply for the things that each party wants. Contrast that with uh, the, you know, the complexes of identity and historical baggage, uh, and um, you know, complexes about control of space and territory that you get in Russia's relationship with Europe. You have none of that. You have a, a normal, as it were, much more healthy set of foreign policy uh, drivers in respect to Asia. to uh, Professor Driscoll, Driscoll, it seems to me that the argument that you're trying to build is that if there is a change of language, conflict resolution will become more possible because we will legitimize the third party involvement in civil war and this is what I've heard in terms of such. Uh, what would be the implications of changing the civil war term to hybrid war? And again, that's um, piggybacking on your argument of resolve would we start with the language change instead of starting with the issue, addressing the issues such as uh, DDR, for instance? I'm very sorry, it's about Ukraine. So, I appreciate very much your, your presentation and your approach, and it's uh, your effort to, to, put into, to put the problem into some academic framework. Uh, really, yes. Uh, but uh, maybe I missed, but I haven't heard uh, the, in, in discussion the example uh, which seems to be uh, extremely important in this case. And I think that uh, the uh, terminology for, for this uh, conflict should be uh, very close to the one we use describing Yugoslavian conflict. Because this is uh, a very similar situation. And this is, uh, so the way Russia participated in this war uh, is not the way uh, uh, in which uh, great powers usually participated, mostly participated in, in, civil, in civil wars. And uh, so it, it's, maybe it is a special case because it's not a unique case and not only Yugoslavia uh, uh, example could be, could be reminded. Uh, a, special, a special case of such wars uh, where it is not, uh, where, where one country uh, and part, uh, some part of citizens of another country uh, thinks themselves to be both to a 
this country and another country. Yes, and this is uh, some special case, a uh, special pattern of wars, not exactly civil and not exactly state. Thank you very much. Now we're finished with the questions, and we start with the opposite order. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I'm glad to have a non-Ukraine question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, Nigel, uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's, it, I simplified a lot in order to fit into a time in terms of band ranking and all that. There's obviously more variation. The one thing uh, I wanted to address is, is, is a very interesting point about the normal relationship with um, uh, Southeast Asia, which I think is, is, is exactly right. But it contrasts, in a way, with uh, the, the South America relationship, which might, under other circumstances, also be, you know, it's not about identity and, you know, or, or any of these things. But because of, uh, essentially, the Monroe Doctrine, uh, that where uh, any, any Russian uh, attempt to gain influence in South America is seen as a uh, uh, a dagger aimed at American, uh, you know, uh, supremacy in the region, or however you want to phrase it, uh, it makes it uh, almost impossible to have a normal relationship in South America, even uh, if they're just doing, if Russia is just doing the kinds of things that it's doing in, in Southeast Asia as part of a normal relationship. So. When Russia was looking to develop um, <coughs> arms sales to Brazil, uh, for example, or, or, or uh, uh, closer economic ties with uh, uh, Argentina or any, any of the other countries in the region, uh, it was immediately turned into a kind of a geopolitical uh, question um, you know, uh, that fraught with potential for what might happen down the road. Um, and so, so Southeast Asia is kind of lucky that way. And that it can just have it. I mean, there, but there are, I mean, obviously this, this question of the China, Russia, US triangle and, uh, you know, uh, plays a role. It's just that because it's not the dominant role it can kind of have the normal relationship. And then the other things can be kind of on the side. Thank you. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll go as quickly as I can, um, standing between you and Rina. Um, uh, why not just call it a hybrid war, um, or, or why not focus on DDR? I, I think that um, uh, there are really a lot of people doing the work already of calling it a hybrid war and viewing it through that lens, um, of calling it, um, I mean, I think that is this, what you described is the status quo approach by, by most people who consider themselves trying to Ukraine. So I don't see any harm in um, introducing a different language. Um, but I think there's no reason to not do both, and I'm sure that in the world we will do both. Um, the reason to um, not only do hybrid war is that it leads to a, kind of a rhetorical tit for tat with Russia where they accuse us of hybrid war. Um, and and uh, the, that, that leads down the rabbit hole of, 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 of Maidan and, and, and losing whose territory. You know, if, if this turns into um, a long-term signaling game where both sides are trying to signal results, we already know what that sounds like because Nigel performed it for us earlier today. It's really eloquent that both sides are getting very dug in for a long-term fight. And um, you know, both sides have arguments that sound pretty good um, in terms of re signaling resolve and having a right to signal the resolve. So that's why to not do that exclusively. The comparison to the Yugoslav conflict is, is, um, is useful and it's one of many conflicts that you could compare this to. Um, one of the things that I think I tried to make the point quickly with my slides but ran out of time is that um, the ethnic hardening that took place in Yugoslavia um, a lot of people thought that was going to happen in Ukraine, and it didn't. How cool is that? Um, you know, the, 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 there aren't that many times in conflict studies where you get to actually notice your predictions being wrong in an optimistic way, and this is one of them. So I think we can seize on that, in a, you know, with, and that's another advantage of using the Yugoslavia analogy, is that when you think about what happened in Bosnia, um, th those are things that uh, smart people who know a lot about the proper nouns and are area experts confidently predicted were going to happen. In 2014 and 2015, and, and, and they were wrong. So, um, the language risk, the risks of changing our language. Um, I, I, I uh, think there are three big risks. 
The first one is that we're going to forget that Russia was involved or whitewash as Russia's role. I don't take that very seriously. Um, but I do take the next two pretty seriously. Um, I, I think that it, uh, there's a risk that it will um, conflate the Crimea and Donbass episodes. Um, the Crimea episode is a violation of Article 2 of the UN Charter and is a big no-no with international law. And then the Donbass is dripping with every kind of ambiguity. And I worry that the use of the term civil war um, contributes to, um, to, to that. And that's, that's, a real, that's a real harm. So um, I, I think that Crimea is a stalemate for a reason. And that's why I try to not talk about it, although, of course, in the book, we're going to have a chapter about it. Um, the, the other disadvantage that some people have um, to the use of the term civil war is that it validates Putin's narrative of a humanitarian intervention coming to the defense of his people. And um, here, I think that it's actually um, it's good to use the term civil war and notice that it's an, it, that he just has the story wrong, is that it's actually an intra ruski mir civil war, that this is Russians killing Russians. But it's just you have certain Russians that are inoculated against um, the Putin regime's uh, media narrative and other Russian speakers who, um, who buy it, and they're, they're the ones who are killing it. That's a totally different way of telling the conflict than the ethnic hardening of uh, um, you know, evil Ukrainians coming to murder Russians, which was the core of the Putin narrative. So there I think that the argument is, is just uh, actually works in the favor of the, of the terminology. But um, I don't want to claim that it's an unadulterated good either, uh, because I think that there's a, um, uh, I, I think the risk of conflating my advocacy is, is explicitly to delink the conversation about um, Crimea from the conversation about Donbass, and I, it's worth acknowledging there may be, there may be disadvantages to that. Thank you, Christy. Uh, Ivan, would you like that? Thank you. Uh, the main thing I'm satisfied in this panel, the, the main uh, discussion is about the constructivist approach. To what, how do we recall something? And what terminology will we use? And this is about constructivism that's actually uh, to reinforce the idea that the choice of the language would choose, uh, would pre uh, you know, uh, will predict the change of the uh, policies. And that's actually the same with Russian American relations, I would say. That I would say uh, when uh, Ronald Reagan called the Soviet Union an evil empire, it's actually, it also implies that the United States is a nation of Jedi. And when he said that no more the, the Soviet Union is a uh, evil empire, it means that Americans stop to be able to die. This is actually the big change. And if you want to change American uh, thinking about themselves, you need to stop thinking about Russia as the same way you, you think today. Thank you. So now you know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we finish our the most important panel. And now we thank all the presenters and the discussion for this brilliant panel. Thank you very much.